This is Solo Only, a character that can't interact with other players. No parties, no market board, no NPC support, just Solo, his trusty axe bill, and the many minions we found along the way. 2.0 is finished. From our humble beginnings taking 8 hours to make gear for Sestasha, to the hundreds of hours spent to clear Ultima, we've unlocked a whole new world of options for Solo and the hardest fights yet. All of the previous fights have been meant for 4 players, but now we've got an 8 player fight on the horizon, Good King Mogulmuk. And so, with the goal of taking down the big Moogle, we're going to need some better firepower. Starting off day one, we grab one of the new quests we unlocked after taking down Ultima. It is time to be blue. Blue Mage is, without question, the strongest solo class in the game, and now it was finally ours. Except it came with a few unique problems. No, wait, hold on, this is this is not safe for stream. The first was leveling. You get the best experience from killing mobs in the overworld, but on my main character, I would just spit a fish at a high level mob and have my friends kill it for me. So this was the first time I'd be doing the grind on my own. It's not too bad, but it'll be a learning curve. Okay, maybe, never mind, I take it back. He did a third of my health. <laughs> the next problem is much worse, making it so, actually, we can talk about that later when it's a bit more relevant. With that, we're off to kill mobs all around the world and check off our grocery list of spells. See, Blue Mage is a bit of a weird class. Rather than just getting all the spells from leveling up, you have to find them yourself by fighting something that casts that spell, waiting for it to use it, and then unaliving it. What? What is that? It even comes with a seven page long book and vague hints on how to get each of them. Within this book are some of the most overpowered spells in the game. From instantly killing your target to becoming practically invincible, this was our best bet for fighting Mogulmog, right? Is the foreshadowing working? Are you hooked? I don't know, man. Uh, like the video and subscribe if you're hooked, and if you aren't, uh, like the video and subscribe. There's gotta be an acorn guy around here somewhere. We did a bunch of blind spell hunting for a while before stumbling into the best spell for leveling. It did not get us the spell. If you die, you won't get the spell now. <laughs> oh, come on. All right, all right. Fine. Things are not looking good at the moment, gamers. A cactuar 10 levels above me and still using level one gear. It was a five minute long fight, but we eventually get there. <gasps> oh. oh, we did it. Oh, what a masterpiece. All right, thousand needles obtained, and now to celebrate. A thousand needles is exactly what it says. A thousand damage split across everything that gets hit by the AoE. So our leveling quickly became cast thousand needles. If it missed or they're still alive, put them to sleep and then cast it again. After a while, we grabbed White Wind, our healing spell, Mighty Guard, which reduces damage we take by 40%, and jumped into our first dungeon, died to the first boss, and finally start listening to my chat. Specifically, one of my mods, Blue, who was an incredible help with all of this. With Basic Instinct under our belt, we head in to kill Ifrit, level synced for Eruption. I might have been a bit, uh, stubborn is a nicer word than lazy, and hadn't actually made any equipment yet, but we were trying anyway. Around two deaths in, we had a run that made it pretty far, but died to enrage after not finishing the nail. Twelve more minutes of dying, we finally stopped to get a gear upgrade. But listen, what if I just used my gatherer gear. <laughs> hey, look at this. Now this is some defense. I knew it would make the difference. All right, we thousand needles, we swift cat, we thousand needles, and he dies. Good, maybe the sardine kills him at this point? Like, just die, please, I beg. All right, thank you. <laughs> we did it. 3,000 XP, that was kind of worth it. 16 minutes for 3,000 XP, we could do that. I got revenge on Temtara and end off the night with a new spell from Hawk Manor. Happy with the first bit of progress, I slept, blissfully ignorant to the suffering I'd be facing on the next day. Blissful ignorance aside, after all that hard work, I think we all deserve a nice snack, which is perfect because this video is sponsored by Tokyo Treat and Sakura Co. It is time once again for the government mandated snack box. For Sakura Co, we have the wonders of Saitama. It comes with chopsticks. These are some very nice chopsticks. They feel great. They've got beautiful little bit of crane artwork running across it. Strawberry cookie. I love strawberry. Take a little, little piece. Oh my god, dude. That's so good. It's not like, it's not artificial fake strawberry. That's like a real strawberry puree cookie. And then, I mean, we gotta eat the faces. And you need to not eat my pears. Oni and Orofuku Rakugan. It's kind of like a meringue. Very, very unique flavor and texture. Absolutely fantastic. And I know Melvina loves meringue, so I'm gonna save these for her. And the tea from Sakurako this time is a very nice green tea. It's a very nice and relaxing tea. Very rich. Tokyo treat time. Mount Fuji snack venture, baby. Let's go. Look at him. He's pogging. They had a bunch of different Kit Kat options. I think I want the pea. 
peach or the melon. That sounds delicious. Mount Fuji sandwich cookies. I gotta try that. Hold on. That's very nice. It's kind of like a Nilla wafer. And then it's got a cream filling on the inside. That's delicious. Okay. Peach Kit Kat. Let's go. I gotta... I'm so excited for this. Oh my god. Wow. Oh, wow. It punches you right in the mouth with flavor. They really don't hold back on the peach. I don't know what Kit Kat is doing, but... This is correct. So why not grab one? You can use my links in the description and coupon code RATH for $5 off of your first box. Every sale from my links helps to support the channel and keeps my little ones fed and happy. Thank you again to Sakurako and Tokyo Treat for sponsoring. Day 2 starts and I lost the recordings, but this was the start of a grind that I was nowhere close to ready for. A grind that would drive me insane. A grind that would push me to my limits. Fishing. Forced by chat to do Feast of Famine, I now had to do all of the fishing quests and one of the most notorious quests in the game. I swear this eventually leads to me fighting Magomag, okay? Just bear with me. Rushing through the early level quests, we're forced to stop and wait for it to rain in Gridania. Since we had some spare time, we throw together a linen robe, hat, and pants to finally get some gear on my blue mage. Armed to the teeth, Cutter's Cry goes down on level sync for Ram's voice, an AoE that freezes everything around me. Checking the weather, turns out it wasn't actually going to rain in Gridania for another 12 hours, so, uh, yeah. Good night. Day 3 was fishing. So much fishing. We snuck in some Blue Mage bits. Doesn't have to be a big deal, you know? It could just be something simple, something small, something eco. Okay. And tried to clear Sustasha hard. Although, I still don't know if we can live this. Yeah, no, that's, um, hmm. We did not. And ended up finishing the level 50 Fisher quest. That's huge! How did I catch that? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> You're bigger than me! That's like three of me, and I'm a giraffe! And the ban will be lifted. Won't it, now that I think about it? If that's the thing people are gonna pull in regularly, maybe we should keep it banned. Think the fishing ban was only in Limsa? Then what, I was a criminal for an entire video? What do you mean? Level 50 quest done, we can start the prerequisite for Feast of Famine. For this, we need two rare fish, a titanic sawfish and a navigator's brand. For the next hour, we failed to get a titanic sawfish, then got decently lucky with the navigator's brand, pulling it up right before it disappeared. We've exploded for good luck? This must be the one- <gasps> The explosion for good luck work? And so, day three ended. No, no, don't start the logout music. Just go to day four because it's time for more fishing. Grabbing the Titanic's office shortly after the day begins, we unlock Beast of Famine, rush over to the first fish, and run into a new problem. And so here we see the elusive and incredible as always, the 50-50. 50% of the time, absolutely every time. Thank you for stopping by my dear big fish can event. Anytime. Anytime now, it's taken a while. We're guaranteed the big one. There it is. And we'll pull, I didn't send up. Okay, I quit. We didn't have the gathering needed to catch the fish. Now it's time to upgrade our gear. Woohoo! We need more Fieldcraft Demi Materia, which meant more grinding for Grand Company seals. Desperately trying to avoid another Hippogriff Massacre, we do a bit of experimenting on new hard mode dungeons and discover the perfect dungeon for seals, Rayflox's is long stop. There's a bronze chest you can get before the first boss that can drop up to two items, each giving 403 seals. Best part is, we don't actually have to fight anything. We could just run past all the enemies, so we'd get up to 806 seals per minute. The the rest of the day was running through Brave Flock's long stop. While grinding out our seals, we took the chance to go for a blue mage upgrade with a cashmere robe of casting. The robe needed a sylphic silk, which we could get from descending a sylph spain fish, so we're back to fishing to finish off the day. Now, you may have noticed, uh, hey, the video quality dropped again. How did that happen? And, um... My power went out. Day 5, the fishing ends today, and we get back to the MSQ to fight Mogglemog. Waking up on a bridge, we discover I could have saved about 10 hours of my life by just descending some spare pants I had laying around. <laughs> We're starting off the day strong. All of that suffering, and I could have just desynthed the three items in my inventory. Finished with our field craft, we make some ancient lumber for an artisan spinning wheel, craft an intricate silver brocade, and trade it in to unlock the Weaver Masterwork 2 recipes. And then we make a terrible discovery. I need 400 gathering. How am I gonna get 400 gathering? I'm glad you asked. I have no idea. So that's an extra 24, so 63 plus 24, we're at 87. I need to pull 13 more gathering out of somewhere, even if I make all of these pieces. It was impossible for us to get the gathering required to catch the Feast of Famine fish. No matter how much materia we put in, gear changes we made, there was nothing available to us within my restrictions that could push us to 400 gathering. Well, there was one way. Oh my god, that's 22 gathering better. I have to catch 
every single big fish in the game? I cannot believe it. I can't. No, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not. I refuse. No, <laughs> this is not happening. Don't forget you're here forever. No, 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 no. We're progressing. I will come back in heaven's word to finish this. I'm getting out of here. I've been stuck fishing for too long. Five days in, we're finally getting back to the MSQ and pushing towards the goal of taking down Mogulma. After escorting a Moogle through the woods, don't worry, Kupo. I will protect you. We've unlocked Thorn March hard. We have unlocked our first eight-man duty. Which is to say that everything that we have done prior to this has been meant for a party of four people. And golly gee willikers, this one is meant for a party of eight. Uh, good luck, I guess. Level sync turned on, we head in for our first attempt. Thorn March is a unique instance in that before being allowed to fight the Good King, you have to get through all of the Mughal's guard first. Round one is Whiskerwall, a paladin with a lot of AoE attacks. But with a high health pool and each auto attack doing 10% of my health, just the first Moogle's guard took 2 minutes to kill and left me with 15% of my health remaining. So we only barely got to see the next round. That was a lot of damage, okay. Nice. Kiting Whiskerwall with Sprint left us a lot healthier, so we lived long enough to start round 2. This time there's two Moogle's guard, Woollywart and Ruffletuft. Ruffletuft is a warrior with more AoEs, and Woollywart is an archer, auto-attacking from range and occasionally raining arrows on a target. With twice the auto-attacks and one that I couldn't kite, we still didn't last very long. This wasn't looking good, so we stepped out and changed from level sync to silence echo. A lot more HP and defense to work with, we reach Ruffletuft again with nearly full health. After some incredibly close calls, the archer goes down and now it's a 1v1 with the warrior. Warrior down, we're on to round 3. Hooksy Pico and Furryfoot are a welcome break. Furryfoot, the conjurer, is the only one of the two that deals damage. Hooksy the Bard just stands near you and throws out the occasional danger zone to dodge. Leaving the Bard for last gives us plenty of time to reset cooldowns and heal back up. And then we're at round four. Hookla summons four meteors, each requiring one party member to stand under them to reduce damage. If you don't do it properly, it gives a stacking vulnerability up for every meteor missed. And Pukna capitalizes on those Vuln stacks using a tank buster every 15 seconds. With three Vuln stacks, the tank buster hit for 3000 damage and both of their auto attacks could hit for up to 1200. It would take one minute for the Vuln stacks to fall off. So just in tank busters alone, I would have to survive 12,000 damage without even seeing the good king this was impossible on my warrior. But that didn't mean completely impossible. We still had Blue Mage as an option, we just have to finish gearing and getting good spells. So for now, we unlock another requirement. Sometime in the next 40 quests, we would have to face off against the original three primals, Ifrit, Garuda, and Titan on hard mode, otherwise it will prevent us from progressing the MSQ. One quick unlock later, we try out the first fight, Ifrit. But his auto attacks and incinerate took us out in just over a minute. Both of these fights were going to need a lot more preparation, so after grabbing two pieces of Ironworks gear and one more attempt at Thorn March, this was the end of day five. Day 6 is fully focused on Blue Mage. And, well, remember that second unique problem I mentioned earlier? This was also the day where it reared its ugly head, but we'll get to that in a minute. First, we need to finish upgrading our gear. So we grab some clusters, kill Golden Fleece for Snurble Tufts, and Caracal for Fleece to make Silk Threads, Natron, Undyed Felt, Terminus Putty, and Cashmere Cloth for a new set of caster pins. To make the other pieces, we needed more Grand Company seals. Back to Brave Flocks we go. Stepping out to grab some Shroud Tea Leaves, we buy our Saurian skins from the Quartermaster, and turn them into Saurian leather to craft our new caster gloves and boots. All that was left was our chest piece, but we're waiting on a fish for that, so we passed the time by getting revenge on Orem Vale. Right as the dungeon finishes, the Sylph Spain is available to catch, so we rush over. No, don't fully quit. Uh, why am I getting a free company invite? Who is even here to invite me to free company? After 30 minutes of not catching a single Sylph Spain, we're back to collecting Blue Mage spells. Specifically, we're going for one of the strongest spells in a Blue Mage's arsenal, Doom. Doom can be obtained from completing challenges within the Masked Carnival, a solo instance for Blue Mages. This also made for a good chance to learn how to play Blue Mage, as I had never really done it before. While clearing the stages, we got enough allied seals to buy a full set of Evenstar armor from the Grand Company vendor, so we had a nice upgrade for the final rounds. Three hours later, 20 stages complete, and and Doom was unlocked. 
The last spell to get was Tailscrew, a spell that, if it hits, drops the enemy to 1 HP. To get it though, we had to kill the first boss of Sastasha Hard. With the spells available to me, the only thing we could do to take it down was rely on Doom. I would have to time Doom perfectly, hope it hit, and before it activated, the boss would have to use Tailscrew, and then it was just surviving the last few seconds before it died. It took around 10 or so attempts, but we eventually got there. With those spells obtained, our blue mage is looking better than ever, and this was the end of day 6. As day 6 ended, I logged out of solo and hopped onto my main character to do some testing on New Game Plus, allowing me to revisit old sections of the MSQ. And it was then that I saw the real problem with Blue Mage. Blue Mage cannot, under any circumstances, progress the MSQ. It can't accept main scenario quests, it can't progress dialogue, and if a quest required clearing an instance, beating that instance on Blue Mage wouldn't count for completing the quest. It can do other quest types, but for some reason, the main scenario completely bans limited classes. So starting day seven, we're back to square one. All of my plans had been foiled, and I needed a new way to take down Mogglemog. And the answer was something I was hoping I wouldn't have to do. The only other option was Gunbreaker. With higher healing than Warrior at these early levels, it might be enough to push us over the line. But there's no Gunbreaker weapon available from crafting, and I can't use the quest gear to use the class, so we have to go back into Palace of the Dead to make a Gunbreaker weapon. For my fight with Ultima on my Warrior, I had to give up all of my Aetherpool gear, so we'd practically be starting from zero grinding out silver chests again. And so that's what we did. All of Day 7 was spent getting to 13, 16, 31 more silver chests to go. Day 8, we flung ourselves at Palace for another few hours until we had just enough Aetherpool grips to make our Pajali Gunblade. Let's hope I don't have to come back here anytime soon. Gunblade in hand, we save an old man in the forest, and Gunbreaker is unlocked. Using the tombstones from Palace and the Mass Carnival, we get a full set of Ironworks gear. With that, there's no upgrades left. This was everything we could possibly do. Before starting Mogglemog attempts, we check off one last spell on our Blue Mage list. Well, it was nice meeting you. I I hope you enjoy the afterlife, sir. <laughs> the boss didn't hit me a single time, dude. What is going on? Song of Torment from the final boss of Pharaoh Sirius. With the last chores finished, all that's left is Stormmarch Hard. Starting out on level sync, things were going much better than my warrior runs. Gunbreaker heals every two GCDs if I never finish my combo, so I end up with much more healing than warrior can do. And that's not even mentioning Aurora, which is a free regen I can use every minute. We still died to the Black Mage and Ninja combo, but Gunbreaker also had an answer to this that we found towards the end of the test runs. Since Super Bolide is an immunity that prevents you from taking any damage, we can use it to dodge the Vuln stacks from the Black Mage's Meteors. Now we just needed more practice with the new class and this final round of Mogglescar. It had been a long day of progress and I could finally see the path to clearing this fight, so this was the end of Day 8. Day 9, Moggle Mog time. We head over to Coerthus to grab an Emperor Fish, craft some Flint Caviar to increase our damage, and jump into Thorn March, starting things off with level sync. Gundraker is able to consistently reach the final set of adds at full health, and we can use the Bard to reset our cooldowns. Using Bolide to survive Meteors and prevent Vuln Stacks, we can't keep up with the ninja's constant tank busters, so we're still stuck at the same wall. The furthest we got was 9% left on Pukna, so it's time to change things up a bit. Going in with Silence Echo instead of level sync doubles the healing we're able to do by adding a trait to Brutal Shell that gives us a shield equal to the HP healed, which is more than enough to stop the tank busters and finally reach Mogglemog. I'm actually really excited to get here. I have not seen this fight since they changed it. And as is tradition, you get to see the worst dance in the entire game, Male Elizabeth. For how incredibly difficult it was to reach the king, the rest of the fight would probably be easy, right? How much is tank stack or party stack? Oh my god! Nine! Nine thousand! Nine thousand damage! Okay, alright, that's a bad one! And it only gets worse from there. Good King Mogglemog uses a set rotation of attacks called the Good King's Decree. Starting with Ninja and Archer, this mechanic doesn't really do anything outside of dropping a big pool of acid. The real problem is the Stone 4 party sack that comes with it. After that, we get some time to breathe with Moggle Go Round, an AoE centered on the King, Warrior, and Paladin, followed by a large Konal AoE from the Bard in the center. Yeah, just a lot of dodge. After that is the first tank stack in the game, a tank buster that's meant to be handled by two people rather than just one. And then, the final decree uses the black mage and white mage and, you guessed it, 
Meteors. Meteors provide Vuln stacks, and the White Mage drops AoEs to dodge. Immediately after, we get a party stack from Stone 4, another AoE to dodge, and a single person tank buster. Then it just repeats until either you or the good king is dead. And so our run dies to the second tank stack. We kept pushing for the rest of the day and got some solid info out of it. Going through all of Mugglemug's mechanics took somewhere between two and a half to three minutes, and the Stone 4 party stacks were two minutes apart. That means I can use my strongest mitigation, Nebula, on both of these party stacks, and I could use my regen, Aurora, twice in between them. But all of this still wasn't enough. Four hours of fighting Mogglemog, and I couldn't get a run to go as far as my first attempt. After running out of food, it was time to step out, restock, and end the day. Day 10, from the second I climbed out of bed, I was determined. Before I logged out today, no matter what it took, Mogglemog was going down. This time, rather than using Flint Caviar for extra damage, we swapped back to Bacon Bread to increase our defenses. An hour of running into the same wall, I wanted to try something different, so we stepped out and turned on Level Sync. With Level Sync active, though I would be a lot weaker, if I managed to survive for three minutes before dying, we could gain a buff called the Echo. For every time we died after the three minute criteria, the Echo would increase all of our stats by 10%, stacking all the way up to 50%. If we did this right, while well, we'd lose out on damage and the increased healing on Brutal Shell, we might have enough raw HP to survive the Meteor Stone 4 combo. The only issue is this turned the fight into a race against the clock. We'd end up losing at least 20 minutes, but at 40% I was down to 30. Going off of our previous fights, 30 minutes was going to be cutting it a bit close. So we decided to risk the instance and take on the King at a 40% buff. I'm just CPSing from here, I'm not gonna do heal combo anymore. Yes! Yes, dude! Get out of here, Bongle Bong! I'm done! I'm finished! <laughs> okay! Oh my god! Finally, dude! Finally! Holy! Ah, this has been miserable! Oh my god! With that, our first eight-man trial is complete. We still have a lot more to go before we're finished Aram Reborn, but that'll have to be for another day. For now, the Good King is defeated, and it's time to head off towards our next trial.